Hello, thank you so much for joining me. Welcome, good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world for those watching on Facebook Live. My name is Jason Levine, and for the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to be talking about some of the latest innovations in the latest update to Premiere Pro, just released about five days ago. So we're going to get started here, and all the content that you'll see, incidentally, uh, was provided to us by uh, editor and director Mike Burton. He's a Sacramento-based filmmaker, so thank you, Mike, for that. Also a frequent Adobe collaborator. And as you just heard in that video that was playing, one of our main themes here is really about efficiency and productivity. And while that sounds very marketing-like, and it is, uh, the thing that I'm going to show you here, there's lots of efficiency makers in this new release. They're just going to make you faster, better, more efficient when crafting your stories, crafting your edits in Premiere Pro. So we're going to start by talking about a new feature called Freeform. And this is kind of a new reimagined way for us to allow you to display and group and tell your story with your footage in, in, in a very visual way before it even hits the timeline. So let's take a look sort of at some content here. And you know, to start, OK, so this is our traditional list view. This is typically how I will bring content in. This is how things come in generally by default. It shows you all of the various metadata fields that you have available to you. I always like to point out that, of course, if you want to add additional metadata fields, never forget that you have this metadata display, which allows you to see everything about your clip, custom things about your clip. I mean, all of this metadata right here is just native to Premiere Pro. And then you have all the XMP metadata, which is standard across all the Adobe apps. And that's fine, but you can't really tell a story this way. And then, of course, we've always had the icon view. And as a lot of people have sort of forgotten, this, this is sort of a very rough storyboarding view. You can actually take clips and drag them around and reorder them how you'd like them to appear in a timeline. You can hover scrub. You can set in and out points, but it's linear. And you can't group, and you can't sort. And this isn't really, this doesn't feel like storytelling. It just feels like, I don't know, dropping clips visually and making them look nice. So we wanted to change that. So enter Freeform View. I'm just going to undock this panel here. And Freeform View, much like its name, is just that. It allows you to take your clips and group them by scene, by theme, or by any type of metadata visually. So here you can have a whole, we have a whole scene of clips shot at the windmills. You've got a lot of flexibility with each of these clips. I can resize them independently, or I can take an entire group of clips and resize those as well. Lots of flexibility there. Okay, so let's bring everything back down to large here. Very good. If we click in the empty space here inside of Freeform, you also have a couple of different options. So you can always align to a grid, or you can reset to the grid based on any particular type of metadata. So like typically for me, I usually just use name. It'll put everything in name order as you might expect. But again, now this has kind of broken our storyboard. Well, we thought about this, and we thought about how users will likely start to craft their stories in the freeform view. So one of the things that we've done is we've allowed you to save and restore layouts. Now, this is on a per bin basis, meaning that those layouts are confined to each of those individual bins. So if I simply click here on Hill's Ride, it takes me back to exactly the way it was before. And you can even take your clips and drag them off screen. So what this really becomes, sort of taking a, a step from Photoshop and Illustrator, it's really like a huge artboard where all of your media can live, and you can group them in any way that you like. All right? So I'll bring these back over here. Zoom back in again. What I wanted to show you was just a couple of different ways that the director, Mike, kind of organized his footage. So again, all by scene, by feel. This kind of gives you an idea. He's got this biking and the trees and the forest scene here. All right, let's come over to something like this. So this, is, this one is called Riding Lesson. This is uh, him teaching his son how to ride a bike. It's kind of got all the clips and the content and the flow of this piece, how it's supposed to be. Now, in this particular one, again, if I hover scrub over these, you can see right here that you've already got your in and out points set. Of course, you can JKL through all of these clips. So if I select them like this, and I simply choose new sequence from clip, it will now build a sequence for us in that order. And again, just allow us to very quickly see our idea come to life and then begin making that timeline exactly how we like it, OK? So we love this new freeform view. Lots of, lots of cool things that you can do with it here. Again, you can save your layouts if you want to stack things like this. Again, we can 
just randomly change size here, do all of this, reset it to the grid at any point in time. Really flexible, really easy to work with, OK? And kind of a reimagined way to storyboard before anything ever hits the timeline. OK. But talking about efficiency, and talking about, again, user, uh, user requests. So you should know that many of the features, if not almost all of them in this release that I'm showcasing now, came from direct user requests, either on our forums or user voice or Twitter or Facebook. And this next one here is directly related to that. And it's some new additions that we've made to the Essential Graphics panel and some things that, again, we have taken and borrowed from Photoshop and After Effects. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with Essential Graphics, this was introduced in Premiere a couple of versions ago. It was designed as a way for editors, so not motion graphics artists, to be able to build motion graphics, lower thirds, text animations, title sequences, credits, transitional elements, anything you can imagine, without having to leave Premiere and without having to be a MoGraph expert. And we added a lot of cool features in here, including the ability to purchase, license, templates directly from Adobe Stock, which we now have, thanks to many of you who are contributors for Adobe Stock, more than 10 million 4K, Ultra HD, 1080, and motion graphics templates. So just 10 million in video alone, which is amazing and enormously larger than it was last year. And we gave you lots of options in terms of how you can author your content here. Again, we have a layers panel, very familiar to Photoshop. So if you've used Photoshop, the whole workflow felt similar. And then we added things like responsive design positioning and responsive design time to protect certain regions of your animation, because these can be stretched out for any duration. But a lot of our users were saying, well, that's all great. And of course, you have direct integration with all of your Adobe fonts, formerly Typekit. right? So even if you license uh, a motion graphics template, like this one right here, if I go into the information, okay, this is telling us that I don't have these fonts. So if I were to license this now, Adobe Fonts automatically synchronizes all of those fonts to Premiere. You now have unlimited font sync used to be capped at around 100. Now it's unlimited. And it just works, which means that even if you have third parties creating things for you, it'll always display properly. That's all awesome. But the one thing that we didn't have were guides and rulers. Because as designers, right, things need to be at a specific place on screen. So yes, of course, we've always had our action safe, title safe margins. Super. <laughs> but that's not really enough. Right? What if I have specific guides? What if I'm in an enterprise environment and my logo bug always has to be in the same position? Or I'm authoring custom subtitles and I want them in a particular position? Or in the case of this text animation here, it needs to be in a specific position. Well, now I'm very happy to announce that we have guides and rulers. And more importantly, these are shareable across your, across your enterprise, across your network. <clears throat> so to go ahead and turn on rulers and show guides. And if you want to start adding guides, it's as simple as dragging them from the ruler into your interface, just like that. Yes, thank you, single clap. Now multiple claps. And oh, ooh, nice. That is awesome. Now, you have some other options, too. Let's clear this. Let's go into Add Guide. So obviously, you can do things like change the color, I tend to like sort of this pinkish purple for my guides, OK? And you can have any number of guides, by the way. There's no limit to the amount that you can have. So you can customize your own thing here, OK? But in having guides, there was still one other element that we actually needed. Much like Photoshop, much like Illustrator, much like InDesign, you need to be able to snap to position. This is like the greatest thing for a designer. XD, all of these other apps have it. We didn't have it here. So now you actually have two ways of doing this. If you remember keyboard shortcuts, I am the worst. I'm the worst at shortcuts. I said it this morning. I will celebrate my 19th year at Adobe. I know six shortcuts. One of them is undo. One of them is not redo. I can't retain redo. I don't know why that is. I swear, I don't know what it is. Uh, it's weird. Anyway, if you hold down the command key, you can now snap not only to your guides, but 
to center and other like positions inside your compositions, just as in Photoshop, just as in Illustrator, InDesign, XD, and elsewhere. If you forget the keyboard shortcut, here in the wrench menu, you will see that we also have Snap in Program Monitor, which you can just leave on as well. So a really elegant way to do that, OK? But it gets better, because as I mentioned, what if we have guides that we want to use consistently? Every production, it needs to be like this. I told you, you can author and share them, and that is absolutely true. Let me go ahead and clear these. And if you go into the guide templates, Here's a couple of templates that I've designed that I always use. 4x3 center cut, if we're going to be doing vertical video, but again, starting with widescreen, and we need to reframe. Here's actually one that Mike Burton, the editor here, created for all of his titles. So I'll go ahead and choose Century. So now I know where this text needs to be. So I can pick this up and grab it. Again, hold my Command key, drop this into position, wind back, play and it's exactly where it's supposed to be very easily. What about custom captions? Again, I'm in an enterprise. These things need to be in a specific place. Let's go ahead and clear these guides. I'll go into Guide Templates, Manage Guides, go into Import. Now, one of the other really cool things I want to tell you about this is that we've created a, basically a new file type here, .guides. They don't get saved to CC libraries. They just get saved anywhere on your disk. So they're very easy to share and package, and you don't need to worry about connectivity. I love CC libraries. It is very likely that coming very soon, you'll be able to sync these to your CC libraries as well. But for enterprise and things where a lot of machines are not typically online, you might be intranet but not intranet, this makes a lot more sense, right? They're very small, easy to manage, easy to handle. Here's the captions preset that we need. Click Open on this. It adds it to my template list. And you, see, you can see you can delete, import, and export them. All right. Click OK. Come in here. Guide templates. Let's go into captions. And there we go. Exactly where they need to be. So is this mind-blowing technology? No, it's guides. Will it make you more efficient in authoring motion graphics templates and doing other things that require some kind of guide as to where things lie on screen? Yes. Efficiency. Marketing, yes. True, also yes. <laughs> Thank you. Your energy is infectious. Now, I mentioned we've made a couple other additions to the Essential Graphics panel, primarily in the appearance section of the Essential Graphics panel. First and foremost, you now have the ability to uh, create text with multiple strokes. We see this a lot in various uh, broadcast content around the world or everywhere, really. So here, I'm just going to add a stroke. Now, I am not a designer, which I say on stream all the time. You'll know that very quickly. But you'll see we have this plus sign here. So you can add any number of strokes. I'm going to add a second one here, something like this little light pink. Okay and add multiple strokes like this, okay, very easily. If, that's, if you're into that sort of thing, you can do that now very easily. Also, and this is actually my favorite new addition, is that we now have a dedicated background layer, or for lack of a better word, a, a background bounding box, which is responsive. So what do I mean by that? So uh, very commonly, especially when I make text animations, and we see this all over, you know, you'll create text, and you'll put a box around it, and then what you want to happen is that as your text grows, the box grows too. Now, this is why we added responsive design position. Because traditionally, what you would do is you would type text, then you would come into Essential Graphics, and you would say, OK, let's now draw a rectangle. And you'd draw a rectangle, and then you'd place it over your text, and then you'd switch the position of the layer, and then you'd come over to responsive design, and you'd say, OK, I want to pin the graphic to the video frame, and I want to pin the text to the graphic, and then they would grow automatically. And that's awesome, and it's great. And you could even say, if it's a lower third, I always want it to be in the bottom right corner like this, and it would always conform there. You can still do this. This is still awesome. Part of why responsive design positioning is so good, if you author content that is meant for multiple screens, which most of us do, right? I've got my widescreen for YouTube and Facebook, square and or vertical for Instagram. 
when you design responsive templates, they will automatically reflow regardless of screen size, orientation, and aspect ratio. So we like this. We want this. But for a simple bounding box, many of you, myself included, anonymously on the web, of course, said, hey, you know, can't we just have like a box that grows? It seems like six steps to do that seems like a lot. And I told you, we're listening, we're reading, we're, we're there, and we heard you. So now, if I click on background, it does just that. It creates a background box. So to stay consistent, I'll go into this little red color here. You can adjust opacity. You can adjust the size. And as you'd expect, if I grab my text tool, again, for those of you unfamiliar with essential graphics, you just type right on canvas. This is how it grows. Gores. The box grows. Yes, thank you again. <laughs> it's great clapping, thank you. OK? Efficiency, so much easier, so much better, right? Want to point out is also, I, I just love highlighting Adobe fonts. Don't forget, you have access to thousands and thousands of fonts as a CC member. You have sorting. If I want to see only my Adobe fonts, and by the way, these are my chosen Adobe fonts because when you log into your system, it shows your licensed fonts. You can always get more, but someone else logs in here, it then shows their fonts. It's very easy to work with Adobe fonts, formerly Typekit. OK. So let's shift gears a little. And we've been talking about efficiency. Let's talk about efficiency and speed in the form of some changes that we've made to our masking and tracking, specifically by making it easier and incredibly faster, especially as you go up in size. So you're going to see marked gains in speed and processing in 4K and 1080. But as you go to 5K, 6K, 8K and beyond, it's actually even faster. It's faster than it was, and it's faster than even the lower raster sizes. I can't quite understand why. It just is. So let me show you how it works now. So here we have a shot. Again, uh, Mike shot this in California. He's wearing this branded. Um, I almost said an ocean shirt. What? What's the word I'm looking for? Wetsuit? Thank you. Ocean shirt. <laughs> English is not my first language. And we want to do what we commonly do, which is maybe blur it out or mosaic it or whatever. Now, if you saw earlier today with myself or with Carl, probably what you're thinking now is, I don't want to blur it. I want to go, I want a content to wear fill it. Yes. But that's not in Premiere. <laughs> what is, is masking and tracking. Concept applies. I'm going to show you two, two different examples. So here you can see I've got a Gaussian blur applied. And that's what we want to use to kind of blur this out. So let me just increase the size here so I can get a slightly more accurate, accurate mask. I'm going to grab my ellipse mask. And let's go ahead and create the mask along our logo here. Again, nothing different. If you did this in Premiere last week, it's the same. The process of doing this is the same. And then, of course, you have your feathering and expansion. Maybe I'll expand it just a, a couple pixels here. OK. Now, under the wrench menu for the tracking method, you will see that there is now a preview option, which is unchecked by default. Because previously, when you would track the position of this, right, you would actually see it and you'd see it drawing the keyframes one by one. And that's fine, and it was OK. We have it off by default now. Now, it is still faster if you re-enable that. If you need to see the track as it's happening, and sometimes you do if it's very difficult in particular, and you know that you're going to have to make some tweaks, it's still legit to do that. It's still faster than it was. If you turn it off, however, it's pretty ridiculously fast. So let's go ahead and select Track Mask Forward, take a sip of water, Done. Keyframes generated. You can see all the keyframes here. Let's go ahead and make this blurry, like that. Go ahead and go back out to fit. And there it is. OK? So something that probably would have taken, this is, a, this is about 48 frames. I mean, it wasn't super fast before, admittedly. It probably would have taken you 20, 26 seconds, right? 
I'm real with you. I know. Single digit seconds. <laughs> and as you, again, go into 6K, 8K, it's, it's crazy fast, all right? Another example, again, common, common use of masking and tracking here. So here we have, this is actually Mike himself, the, the director and editor. And we simply wanted to use a little bit of Lumetri on his face to kind of brighten up. Uh, he's a bit in shadow in this shot, all right? So I'm just going to modify this here. I'm going to get rid of these keyframes while I'm at it. All right. Oh, we've already got some settings in Lumetri. I'm probably going to readjust those ever so slightly. Create our mask like this. Now, this could also be in lieu of using our HSL secondaries right, inside of the Lumetri color panel. Why I would probably do the mask and track here in lieu of HSL secondary is that, for one, I only want to brighten up his face. All right. So, so here's before, after. Um, the other part of the body I'm OK with. But again, you have that kind of skin tone and a lot of other elements in this shot. So to use an HSL secondary, it's less elegant. I just like to track his face and do some color correction on the face. All right? Once again, we have our mask. I can probably drop the feather a little bit here. That was really, really feathered. Expand it just a little bit. Track forward. Done like that. Come up to Lumetri here, before, after. All right, I went a, li I went a little hot there. <laughs> Ever want to create a nice circle on your head? No, bad job, but you get the idea. Track crazy fast, all right? Super fast and efficient. Efficiency, that is the name of this game. Let's be more efficient. Now, I just talked a lot about 4K, 5K, 6K, 8K. 16K. And as we go into those larger rasters, of course, one, we need more powerful systems. We need different ways to handle all that native media. And of course, anyone knows, if you're going to be working in 6, 8, and beyond, this is why we introduced proxy workflows, right? It's just, it's just the way to do it. I edit everything on a laptop. And yeah, I even edit 8K on a laptop because that format is not so uncommon now. So how do I work with 8K? Well, one, I'll create proxies. That makes it a lot easier. Two, we also have, of course, our fractional playback resolutions, which make it easier to display on screen. Fewer pixels, but you can go into a pause resolution that shows you all of your detail. But then we start applying effects, right? Then we do some masking. And maybe we'll do, again, a color correction. And then maybe we'll add some additional Lumetri or some input LUTs. And then we'll do some other things. Or maybe we'll use some red giant effects again. And as we begin stylizing and adding all of these effects and content on our 6K, 8K footage, well, now it's getting heavier, right? So now we're having to use the GPU, having to use more CPU. It would be really cool if we could just freeze it all. Now, you've always had the option to render and replace. And this is wonderful, right? And, or, or preview files, same concept. You quickly do a render, it takes it off the GPU, takes it off the CPU, plays a lot faster. The limitation previously was that if you wanted to then go back to, oh, I need to make a change to Lumetri or something else, well, you replace that original footage. So you'd have to bring it back in. You'd have to reapply effects. It was, it was not a simple task. Like, you basically committed, and then if you had to redo it, you were OK with redoing it because at least it was playing better. But we wanted to reimagine that workflow. So here you can see on this particular clip, I have warp stabilizer and Lumetri color. Sorry, there's a step here. And I, I keep feeling like I'm going to fall if I don't step on it. But when I'm on it, it's too high up, and it's weird. So I apologize. OK. Sorry, cameraman, if that's freaking you out over there. So we've got real-time warp stabilizer and Lumetri. So here it is without both. All right, kind of flat, kind of shaky. Let's put both those effects on. Looks good. OK. I'm going to right click here and choose Render and Replace. And when I do that, first and foremost, this dialog, if you've never seen it, will probably look familiar if you've ever used our ingest dialog before. But we have a new checkbox down here called Include Video Effects. So now when I check that and click OK, it will render it out, right, matching the sequence settings or you can choose a specific preset. And now what you see is that it's the same clip replaced, but the effects show up as rendered. 
So now, of course, this just plays smoothly, beautifully, brilliantly, right? Oh, but the director just said, yeah, you know, the sky's a little blown at. We kind of want to go for a more filmic look. We want to drop the contrast a bit, maybe put on one of those film stock LUTs. Can you just swap that out in Lumetri very quickly? Previously, it was not a quick process. Now, if I simply choose Restore Unrendered, and because now it understands that there were video effects there, boom, it's instantaneous, and now we have access to all of the parameters of those effects once again. Okay? So, as you render and replace now, truly it remains fully editable, and there's no relocating of media in the project panel. There's no additional dragging, nothing. It just happens right there inside of the effects, and you keep working. All right? Really, really cool. OK. So the very last thing I'm going to show you is actually a product that is for my usage and for many of you. And you may be unfamiliar with it. And we haven't shown it here at NAB, which is why I'm showing it to you, which is Adobe Premiere Rush. So Adobe Premiere Rush was introduced this past October at Max, you might recall, by one of my esteemed colleagues, Daniel Darby, got to show this on the Max stage. And it is truly an application that allows you to work on the desktop, allows you to work on your mobile devices. It's currently on iOS. You may have seen that it premiered and will be premiering on the Samsung S10 at their keynote a few weeks back. So you're going to have it on Android very soon. Can't say when. Don't ask. Now, I use this to shoot. Part of why I use this to shoot is because when you use Rush, which you will find out if you have iOS and soon Android, is that what that means is you have a fully manual 4K camera. Huh? Well, again, now there's lots of apps that allow you to control the camera, say, on iOS, right? Filmic Pro is one of them. You can change shutter speed. You can change ISO. You can change all these elements. So you can in Rush's camera as well. So I use it because I capture a lot of things with my, with my iPhone or iPad. I can adjust shutter speed. I can adjust ISO. I can adjust uh, a, a general gain. I can adjust temperature. All of these things in camera, right there. And then, of course, I can begin to craft my story. So here's some content that I shot uh, the 42nd floor uh, from the Hilton in San Francisco. What is this here? Oh, that's a motion graphics template. So again, it's a very simple, easy to understand layout. Here's your titles. And if I go into Titles, much as we saw in the Essential Graphics in Premiere, now you have access to Titles. You also have access to Adobe Stock, so you can license more here. And there's many that were specifically created for Rush that work brilliantly, efficiently. Drag and drop, edit, make them your own. Similarly with color, again, you don't have to think about LUTs and everything else. We give you presets. You can design your own presets. You also have access to the native controls of the basic module of Lumetri, which is basically like the Lightroom develop module. So if you're a photographer, you can instantly become a color grading artist in Rush. Well, maybe not. <laughs> color grading is an art. But you have access to the manual controls here. You also have auto ducking for music and dialogue. Incredible flexibility. And then the ability to share this out to all of your favorite social networks. Oh, and of course, it goes without saying. I mentioned it before. Right inside the app here, this is so wonderful. You can change the orientation. So in Rush, automatically, you don't have to think about it. You can create the landscape, the portrait, and the square version, and it just does it. Very nice. Another reason to have those responsive templates. But maybe you now want to take it a step further. Maybe you want to use some of these new things in Premiere. Maybe you're wanting to up your game in editing. Premiere Pro, let's go ahead and close this. I'm going to close all projects. And right in Premiere Pro, you'll see that we have a button here to open Premiere Rush projects. And as you might expect, this allows you, this is going to see all the same content. All of this is synchronized to Creative Cloud. Go ahead and choose my San Francisco scene, OK? It brings it into Premiere Pro, my motion graphics template. Notice, I didn't even save anything. It remembered that I wanted it in Square, because that's how I left it, right? It's constantly synchronizing your changes. And this is an amazing way to get into that professional application now and leverage all of those new things that I just showed you. So my friends, efficiency, performance, and stability, there are so many additional features in this latest version of Premiere Pro. Um, 
new file format support, lots of new workflows, faster integration with Audition, more there, more to come, so much more in all the applications. You can see it all on the other side of the stage. Coming up now, I believe we have Andrew Kramer is coming up now, if I'm not mistaken. Is Andrew coming up? Yes, keep going, keep talking, stretch it out. Five minutes. I was just going to say, and the man who needs no introduction, but now I have to introduce him. Well, if you don't know Andrew Kramer, everybody does. Video co-pilot. So stick around. You're going to see some amazing things. If you don't know Andrew, he is the video co-pilot. He is an After Effects master. He has graced our stage many, many times. He's done graphics for Star Wars. He's done graphics for some of the biggest productions in Hollywood and everywhere. And on top of it all, he's a genuinely awesome human being. You do not want to miss his presentation. It will inspire you. It will want you to step outside of your comfort zone and become a motion graphics After Effects wizard. You don't even have to be a wizard. You're just going to enjoy doing it more because of the way he explains it and shows it to you. I'm going to step off. We've got about three minutes. We're going to play a little ro uh, reel here, and then Andrew will come up. Enjoy the rest of NAB Day 1. Thank you so much. We'll see you again next time. Thank you, everybody.